Today I'm going to give you a tour of my SGI Tezro and before I get to the tour itself I'm quickly going to give you a brief overview of the machine. The SGI Tezro was a series of high-end computer workstations sold by SGI from 2003 up until 2006. Using MIP CPUs and running IRIX, it was the immediate successor of the SGI Octane line. The Tezro marked the return of the original Cube logo to SGI machines. The systems were produced in both rack mount and desk side versions and the series was released in June 2003 and had a starting list price of $20,500. The Tezro was released alongside the Onyx 4 and rack mountable Tezros shared many components with them including the plastic skins. The rack mounted Tezros were functionally very similar to the infinite performance equipped SGI Onyx 350s. Similar to other SGI systems, the Tezro used a non-blocking crossbar interconnect to connect all the subsystems together. The Tezro was based on SGI's Origin 3000 architecture. Arx was provided as boot firmware, as with other SGI systems of that era. Tezro systems used two or four 64-bit MIPS R16000 microprocessors. The following R16000 processor types were available as options for the machine. Node boards from the Origin 350 or 3900 systems were compatible with the Tezra and used the same RAM. For example, a Quad R16K 700MHz node board with 8MB of level 2 cache from a CX brick would work in a Tezra, likewise other boards up to the Quad 1GHz edition. The Tezro was shipped with 512MB of DDR, SD RAM, and it could be expanded using proprietary DIMMs. The desk side version could hold up to 8GB of main memory total, and the rack version could hold up to 8GB of memory per brick. Two bricks could be linked directly via Numalink cables, or up to 8 using a Numalink router. The Tezro supported VPro, V10 and V12 graphics options. Dual channel options were produced for the desk side variant, allowing up to two 1920 by 1200 displays, while dual head and dual channel were available for the rack version, allowing a fully equipped rack mount Tezra to drive up to four 1920 by 1200 displays at once. Desk side system shipped with analog output as standard, and PCI cards provided audio capabilities, including two channel 24 bit EAS and eight channel. ADAT connectors on rack mountable versions. The number of available 64-bit PCI slots included in a Tezro system depended upon the number of CPUs installed in the system. For example, seven 133 to 100 MHz slots were available in a 4-CPU desk side system, three 133 or 100 MHz slots were available in a single CPU desk side system, Six 100 megahertz slots were available and two 66 megahertz slots in a four CPU rack mountable system and two 100 megahertz slots and one 66 megahertz slots were available in a two CPU rack mountable system. All PCI slots in a Tezra system were 3.3 volts card slots. Now that I've given you an overview of the Tezra, I will continue with the hardware tour. I'm going to start the hardware tour by taking a look at the machine's front panel and the most prominent feature of the front panel is the old Cube SGI logo situated in the center. There are also four vents which are found in the four corners of the front panel and the new SGI logo sits in the center towards the bottom. Towards the top in the center you've got the Silicon Graphics Tezro label and I'm now going to take a look at the top of the machine where you find a latch and when you depress this latch, it opens the front door of the machine. Okay, once the door is opened, it reveals the DVD-ROM, as well as two hard drive sleds, the reset button for the machine, the machine's power button, and the status display, as well as the machine's power on LED. This brings us to the machine's rear panel. And I'm going to start off by pointing out these two tabs. When depressed, they allow the machine's side panels to be removed, and I'll cover them at a later stage in the video. Starting off on the left-hand side at the top, there's a standard PS2 port for keyboard, 
as well as mouse, and there are four RCA jacks for the line in and line out for the machine's onboard sound. There's a jack for speaker and headphone, as well as a jack for microphone, as well as a jack which supplies 12 volts DC at 1 amp for the optional desktop speakers. And below are three exhaust fans which draw warm air off the noteboard. And in the center of the back panel, you've got your PCI options. The top slot is occupied by the IO9 card, which is a card which is necessary in order for this machine to operate. Below that is a RAD audio card, and below that is an optional serial card, which supplies two extra serial ports to the machine. And below that is an optional gigabit Ethernet card, and below that is an optional USB card, and below that there are two 2 gigabit fiber channel cards. And below that is the DM3 video option. When looking at the graphics side of things, it's fitted with a dual channel display, and these are DVI outputs. You've got a swap ready output, the output for the 3D glasses, as well as a Genlock output. On this section here, if you remove these three screws and open this little door, it basically allows you to remove any of the optional cards that are fitted to the machine. Taking a look in the center towards the top right hand side, there's an L1 port, two serial ports and a console port. If you want to go in via serial console, this is the port that you'll make use of. Above that is the machine's power supply with an exhaust fan and a standard kettle plug connector to supply power to the machine. I'm now going to remove the cover on the I.O. side of the machine and in order to do this, I locate the tab on the rear side of the cover, depress it and it allows me to pull the cover away. Now taking a look at the inside of the machine, towards the top is the power supply, below that is the IO9 card. Now this card is responsible for the, all the IO in the machine, so the various drives are slotted into it. Below that are all the other option cards that I mentioned, with the DM3 video option at the bottom, and below that within the shroud is the V12 graphics option. Okay, taking a look over here, you see the two fans which blow air through the V12, and there are another two fans which blow air through the PCI option cards. I'm going to remove the side panel from the node board side of the machine. And in order to do this, again, I locate the tab at the rear of the side panel, depress it, and it allows me to move the panel upwards and outwards. Taking a look at what lies within, towards the top you have the hard drive bays, and behind which is a fan which basically draws the warm air towards the rear of the machine. Okay, looking at the actual node board itself, because this is the quad 1 gigahertz machine, you've got three fans which basically force air through the shroud, which houses the four CPUs as well as the bedrock. Now the bedrock is the crossbar router which links all of these systems together, and it's located between CPU A and CPU C within this module. Behind this, you've got the two RAM banks. This machine is currently fitted with 6 gigs of the possible 8 that it could be fitted with. And between the RAM banks are the VRMs for the machine. So what these regulator modules do is they regulate the voltages for the various components here, being the RAM, the CPU, and such. And behind this are the fans which vent the warm air out of the node board section. Now that I have the machine back in position, I'm quickly going to show you her status display. Okay, and whenever there's AC supplied to the machine, this display will be backlit. And if the machine is in a powered down state, as it is now, it'll show you that L1 is running. And when the machine is powered up, obviously it'll tell you that it's booting as the prom boots. And it'll also tell you that the OS is running once the operating system is loaded. I'm quickly going to take you through the process that I go through in order to boot this machine over serial as I generally don't like to make use of the machine's power button because it sits behind the front door of the machine and this will wear the latch out if I continuously open and close this front door. So here goes. Because I'm using a Mac, I make use of a program called Serial Tools. And I'm quickly going to get myself to the L1 prompt. Okay, now I'm at the L1 prompt. I type in PWR space U to power the machine up. 
And here it goes, there she starts. I'm just gonna let her run at normal speed for now and I'll then speed her up just so that you can see the process that she goes through but I don't want you to sit here waiting for the time that this takes in real time. Now that Irix is up and running, I'm quickly going to log in as root and play around a bit. Okay, firstly I'm going to show you my network filing system that I've got set up between my Mac and the Tezra. This allows me to easily share files between these two systems. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and run some demos just to show you the machine's performance again. Okay, and here goes PowerFlip. I'm going to bring up Beethoven. I'm going to display performance. I'm quickly going to set up some light sources. Red local, green local, yellow local, as well as white local. But now I'm just going to make a bit of a correction because I ran the same test on my Onyx 2 and I noticed when I did the test that when you turn off white infinite you get improved performance. So I'm going to do this with this. So there goes Beethoven. I'm going to bring up the logo for Silicon Graphics. I'm going to set, up, set it up in the same way. Okay, performance, light sources, red local. green local, yellow local, and white local. And remove the infinite. Okay, I'm going to bring up one more. Let's just see. We can bring up the Porsche as well. Display performance. Set up the light sources, so it's the red one, the green one, the yellow one, and the white one. Switch off the infinite lights. Okay, so with these three frames, which are rather large, I'm just going to see if changing their size changes the performance. You've got pretty good performance running here out of all three demos. I'm going to keep them up and running. It's going to go back one or two. Go to games. Bring up Doom. Okay, so we've got Doom running as well. Let's see if I can't bring up Quake as well. Let's just see software. Yeah, so I'm going to try and bring up Quake as well. And I'll also get Quake 2 running as well. And this just gives you some idea of this machine's performance. So I'm just going to close all of these folders just so I can arrange things around here quickly. Okay, just bring Doom out. So there you have it, you have Quake 1 and Quake 2 running. You've got Doom running, you've got all three of these um, models running as well. 
Let's just check the performances on them. It's 22 frames a second, 28 frames a second, and 21 frames a second. So this just gives you some sort of ideas to the Tezra's performance. And I can even make it even more, strain the machine a bit more by bringing up Maya as well. So this just shows you, these machines are almost bulletproof. I mean, I was quite disappointed with my Onyx 2's performance, but this machine is incredible when it comes to the performance that you get from it. I'm just going to make this window a little bit smaller. See if I can't open a scene. See that. I'll bring up my little universe that I made. And there we go. So you've got that scene as well. And I'm going to see if I can quickly articulate it. And there we go. It articulates pretty well. I'm just going to quickly bring up the gross overview so that you can see that this machine's only basically being half strained at this point. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start closing windows. Just to unload the machine. And there you have it. Bring up Doom, so you've got Quake still running there. Okay, and that gets rid of that. But it just shows you this machine has plenty of headroom available. Okay, and this brings me to the end of my video. I hope that you enjoyed this little hardware tour, as well as a demonstration, and I hope that you found it to be informative.